Well, hello again. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this series on the everyday way. We come to our last talk today from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 to 34. Truly remembering Jesus. Let me pray before I start. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have spoken to us through this letter in 1 Corinthians. Uh, Father, we pray that uh, we are still growing in uh, doing everything for your glory. And Father, we pray now that as you teach us from your word about the Lord's Supper, uh, it might help us to show what truly matters to you. And Father, we want be people who are not just uh, hearing about Jesus' love, but putting it into practice. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if I was to ask you uh, what makes for a good Lord's Supper or what makes for a good Holy Communion, what would you say? I think we immediately think of our experience, our traditions in our church. Um, we think of whether we like the common cup or the individual cup, whether we like uh, going to the rail or whether we like staying seated. Um, today we're going to see what really matters to God when it comes to the Lord's Supper. Today, as I said, is the last talk in our series on the everyday way, the everyday way of the worship of God, uh, the way of giving God glory to God, whatever we're doing, not just in church. But when we come to this section, uh, Paul's letter, he hones in here on his teaching about the Lord's Supper. Now, just at the outset, it's clear Paul is not thinking of exactly what we do when we have communion. I mean, we have it in a church building on a particular day with a little bit of bread, a little bit of wine and grape juice. Um, I usually lead it or some other ordained minister. Clearly what the Corinthians were doing was different. Uh, it's quite clear from the text they were sharing in a full meal together. I mean, otherwise Paul wouldn't talk about having homes to eat and drink in. He, he, there was no way that the way we do it, anyone could get drunk unless I feel particularly thirsty. We do things very differently. But the core of it is the same, eating some bread and drinking some wine uh, to represent Jesus giving his body for us and Jesus shedding his blood for us. Christians down through the centuries have covered the details in different ways, but these elements have been the physical constants through the ages. Now, just by acknowledging that, we should realise the details of our ceremony should not be the centre of our attention. The Bible gives us plenty of freedom in that regard. So what is the Lord's Supper all about? Well, well Paul's actually already uh, given us some teaching about it earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 and 17. So let's go back there and just remind ourselves of what we heard. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 and 17. Paul writes, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. So in verse 16 there, Paul's rhetorical questions uh, to the effect that when we eat and drink in the Lord's Supper, we participate or share in the body and blood of Christ. Now, this can't mean that we're doing something that merits our salvation. Remember, from chapter 1 in Corinthians, uh, we do not boast in ourselves, we boast in Christ alone. And we need to speak against uh, the Catholic heresy, the Roman Catholic heresy of transubstantiation. We're not re-offering Christ uh, when we conduct the Lord's Supper. We're sharing in an offering that's already happened and that is done. It's the offering of Christ himself on the cross about 2,000 years ago. And so we eat and drink with great thankfulness because as I remember Jesus' death and I trust in his death, his death is my death and his suffering is my suffering. So that now for me, judgment is done. My sins are forgiven. My transgressions cancelled. I have peace with God and I look forward to resurrection and life with God forever when Jesus returns. Now, now also in these verses... It reminds us uh, of the powerful message of unification we hear through the Lord's Supper. So 1 Corinthians 10, 17, Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake in the one loaf. So as Christ's people, we come from many different backgrounds, um, ethnicities, uh, social 
demographics, whatever it might be, when we come to God through one means, Christ's saving sacrifice for us. What makes for a good Lord's Supper? Well, just from these few verses in chapter 10, we're reminded that the Lord's Supper should be a moment where we especially remember we are saved because of Christ's death and we are one because we all share in the one Saviour. The Lord's Supper should be a moment doing great good for a church, encouraging and strengthening and unifying us all. And so what Paul says in the first uh, verse in our section today is shocking because Paul says when the Corinthians are having the Lord's Supper, it's actually doing this church harm. So let's look at our first point, a Lord's Supper that's doing damage. Look at uh, chapter 11, verse 17. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. Paul's heard reports of what's going on in their gatherings with the Lord's Supper and his judgment comes down and his judgment's not good. They're actually doing damage to the church as they eat and drink together in Jesus' name. Verse 18, in the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. The Lord's Supper is meant to be a powerful reminder that Jesus' church is one body. But when this church comes together, there are schisms. You know that word schism? You know, a breakaway group, a fracturing of the unity. Now the word that's translated division here comes from the Greek word schisma. And Paul's not surprised to hear of these schisms because he knows there's a serious problem with division in the Corinthian church. Remember right back at the start of the letter. If you went back to chapter 1 verse 10, you'd, you'd, you'd read again, Paul urges them to have no schisms, no divisions, and to stop dividing over silly things like who their favourite preacher was. And their schisms were based on their pride and it wasn't good. And now uh, their schisms are coming out in very ugly ways indeed. Uh, ugly ways at the very moment they're meant to be remembering Jesus. So let's keep reading and see exactly what this problem is. Verse 20, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without wanting, sorry, without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. But how can Paul praise them for a Lord's Supper where some are greedily hogging food, while others who are actually poor go without. Notice the, the, the people who are, they, they actually have nothing and they're being left out in the cold. It's a disgrace. And it's completely un Jesus like, isn't it? We know the term un Australian you know, to describe uh, something that contradicts the values that we hold most dear as, you know, as a nation. It might be discriminating against someone on the basis of the race. It's un Australian. It might be ignoring Anzac Day, that's un-Australian. It might be not entering a sweepstakes on Melbourne Cup Day, un-Australian. Uh, it might be saying we don't like Test Cricket on Boxing Day, un-Australian. We call things out as un-Australian because they're just out of place uh, in this nation and who we are. Paul's doing the same thing here when he hears of a Lord's Supper that's happening with lots of selfishness and greed and neglect of the most needy in the church. He says that's completely un-Christian it's a disgrace. Paul says you are in fact despising the church of God, looking after number one in the name of the one who put himself last. Call it anything you like, but don't call it the Lord's Supper. This is just gross hypocrisy, isn't it? Gross hypocrisy, claiming the name of Jesus, acting in a completely un-Jesus-like way, Paul says it's doing serious damage. Well, that's what the Lord's Supper should not look like. Selfishness and neglect. What should, be, what should it be about? 
Well, the next section, Paul takes the Corinthians back to the words of the Lord himself. And he reminds them of the Lord's Supper according to Jesus. The Lord's Supper according to Jesus. Now, if you look there in verse 23, it starts with the word for. And so what it's saying is that this next section is an explanation of Paul's condemnation of their current Lord's Supper gatherings. So 11.23, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Uh, the Corinthians should know this. They've heard this before. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper he took the, the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, the word betrayed here is a translation of the Greek word paradidomi which means handing over. So this can mean betrayal. Uh, but this word is used multiple times in the gospel accounts of Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, I think showing that Jesus is being handed over to darkness and judgment. So Paul, I think, might be saying, on the very night that Jesus knew he was going to be handed over to death and judgment, he makes the Passover meal all about him. Now remember, the Last Supper was a Passover meal. And it's stunning that Jesus, about to shed his blood for the sins of the world, says, Now, from now on, whenever you celebrate this Passover meal, remember me. Now, when you celebrate this meal, don't remember God sending the plagues. Don't remember the crossing of the Red Sea. Don't remember God conquering Egypt and Pharaoh. Remember me. Jesus says, remember, I redeem you. Remember, I am sealing a new covenant with my blood. And what's at the heart of what Jesus did? He gave his life for us. His body given for us, represented by the broken bread. His body pierced for us with the blood poured out, represented uh, by the drink. The Lord's Supper is about remembering Jesus' sacrifice to save us from our sin. It's about remembering Jesus' love. His love for all of his people, not just some of them. And at its heart, it's, it's not just a quiet reflection. It's actually a loud proclamation that Jesus died for sinners like you and me. So the last sentence in this paragraph, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord's Supper causes us to look back at the amazing love of Jesus to save us from our sin and proclaims that until he comes back in glory. So we give thanks and we hear again how much God loves us. Now if we hear then what the Lord's Supper proclaims, that we're assured of our salvation in Christ, that we're forgiven our sins, completely blotted out, we can't help but hear this message as well. If I love Jesus, I want to love others the way he's loved me. And that's why a Lord's Supper without love is no Lord's Supper at all. The Lord's Supper was a remembrance and a proclamation of the once for all sacrifice of Christ. But the Corinthians were doing damage in not acting it out in love. So what was the way back? Well, it started with a good hard look at themselves. So let's look at examining ourselves, examining ourselves. 27 through to 29. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Now, this, this phrase, unworthy manner, taking the, the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, we don't have to speculate as to what it means. We don't have to try and invent some meaning. Um, we saw what it meant in the first section of the passage. It, it's claiming to remember Christ and then be full of greed, neglect, selfishness, even to the point of humiliating those whom Jesus died for. It's claiming to know the love of Christ to you and they're not showing that love to your brothers and sisters in Christ. 
So eating in an unworthy manner is, is not recognizing the body of the Lord. It's ignoring the church of God and therefore ignoring Christ himself. It's important to remember that. The way you treat Christ's people is the way you treat Christ himself. And that's a concept right through the New Testament. Um, and you can just look over one page in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Paul writes to the church of God in Corinth and he says, Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. You, the way you treat Jesus is the way you treat his body and vice versa. That, that's, that's why Jesus in the parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25 says, Whatever you do to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you do to me. And whatever you do not do for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you do not do for me. The way you treat Christ is the way you treat his people. And that's why the failure of the Corinthians is so serious. If you serve yourself and neglect the poor in your midst, you despise the church of God and you despise Jesus Christ himself. So no wonder Paul is so strong in his language. No wonder in verse 30, it says God has even struck some sick and even dead because of their sin. No wonder there's a great need to evaluate ourselves now so we don't face condemnation eternally. Verse 31, back in chapter 11. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So we go hard on ourselves now so that we repent and come back to God. And we examine ourselves and ask ourselves honestly, are we seeking to love our brothers and sisters in Christ the way that Christ has loved us? So examining ourselves, it's not some vague notion of uh, how much faith do I have? Do I have enough faith? It's not uh, whether you feel right. Do I, do I love Jesus enough? It's, it's asking these kind of questions. For example, is there someone I'm not talking to in my church family? Are there people that I haven't forgiven? Am I being greedy in hoarding good things that I have and not sharing them with those in need? Not just money, but maybe gifts and abilities. Examining yourself in this way is the reason that in the uh, prayer book we use at church, we, we introduce the Lord's Supper like this. Let me quote to you from it. This is just in the standard preface uh, introduction to our Holy Communion service. But those who would eat the bread and drink of the cup of the Lord must examine themselves and amend their lives. They must come with a penitent heart and steadfast faith. Above all, they must give thanks to God for his love towards us in Christ Jesus. You then who truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbours and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to strengthen and comfort you. See what it's saying? Uh, when we come to share in the Lord's Supper, uh, we acknowledge that we give thanks to God for what he's done for us in Christ. And we seek to see, am I living in love with my neighbours, particularly my brothers and sisters in church? And if I'm not, I confess and I ask God to help me to change and put that into practice. And so the first point in that service is a prayer of confession. And then it moves through uh, to remembering Jesus. So what makes for a good Lord's Supper? Well, it's one where people love each other the way Christ has loved them. And that's why Paul finishes with this very practical, concrete instruction in verses 33 to 34, waiting for each other. Chapter 11, verse 33 and 34. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further directions. So the Lord's Supper that does harm is one where people are saying they love Jesus but won't lift a finger for Christ's body. 
the Lord's Supper that strengthens and comforts is where Christ's death is proclaimed and people turn to consider the way they can love Christ's body around them. So as a church with the Lord's Supper, let's not get caught up, let's not get bogged down in the details of our tradition. Let's make sure we major on truly remembering the amazing news that Jesus died for us and setting our minds on loving his body the way he's loved us. Now, when you think about that, extending Jesus' love to our church family, uh, that's not something just done by performing a tradition once a month or even every Sunday. That's something to be lived every day in obedience to the Lord, to the glory of God. It's really just what Jesus taught his disciples in John 13, 34. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. One of the marks of a Christian church is uh, conducting this meal called the Lord's Supper where we remember why we're saved, remember God's love, remember that we are to be a people of love too. But Jesus said the mark of being his people is that we would love one another the way he's loved us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we reflect on this teaching on the Lord's Supper, uh, first of all, we want to say thank you for the gift of Jesus, for giving his life to us so we could share in your life. And we want to say sorry, because as we uh, hear about this situation in Corinth, we can know there are ways we have failed your people, and so we've failed loving Jesus. And Father, we uh, thank you that we can be forgiven, and please uh, change us and help us to be people that are eager to show your love to your people. And Father, we pray that as we do that, it will bring great glory to you, so that others can come to know Jesus and be saved. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.